Well, um, the first time I really understood how deep um, racial discrimination was and that it was not just um, different people having prejudice, but that it was actually a systemic issue was between five and six years ago when we um, came to our current church, um, which is, you know, I would say uh, more than 50% African American population. And I was really, really taken aback by uh, the fact that what I had learned in history and the way I had grown up was not really what was true for um, what people of color were experiencing. Um, I grew up uh, mostly surrounded by white people. I mean, we had, you know, a few people, a few black people in, in my life between elementary school and college. Um, my parents were not, uh, I did not see them as being racist in any way. They never said disparaging things about other people. Um, and so I kind of assumed that, you know, after, after everything that happened in America's history and after Martin Luther King, I just kind of had this very wrong assumption that everything was fine. Um, I've always tried to be like a kind person, you know, and, and so I, I really truly did not witness things that seemed like racism. Now, I did have um, a few people, not in my nuclear family, but a few people outside of our nuclear family who um, I would say are racist. Um, one of whom is long deceased, but I remember as a child her saying things and my dad almost having a reaction like <sighs> so so I think I got the impression from you know from him that that was really wrong but we were in a small group here um, and even even our our pastor would say things like systemic racism and I was like what does that mean so we had several we've had several conversations over the years with um, our friends from church and just hearing their, you know, their really painful life experiences and um, I was shocked and saddened and um, and now of course on Facebook, I wasn't on Facebook for the longest time but I've been on there a couple years and so I'm really seeing that this was a huge problem that was um, outside of my awareness. I would say that um, with me growing up as a kid, um, trying to think about this question, trying to be able to answer it, it's, it's very similar in the fact to what my wife had said. It's just that I grew up in an area that was mostly white. I mean, there were, I would probably say like 20% of like the kids at my school were African American. And so I wasn't like totally in this extreme white bubble, but it definitely was, you know, I was, it was majority white. And like I, growing up, my parents never, you know, they weren't disparaging about other people. They, they tried to talk, teach us that we need to love everybody and be kind and respectful of everybody. And I never witnessed my, my parents or anybody else in my family really being racist or saying disparaging things or being mean to, to people. Um, this, just growing up though, you start, as you get older and older, you start to notice things about society and where you're living and your activities and what's going on. And, I played sports in high school and I noticed the county where I, I lived in and grew up like it seemed like all of the African-American kids were located at like two schools in the county and the rest of the schools in the county were all white and so you start to gradually start to pick up on things like that like huh wonder why that is you start to you start to see things and I knew that there was again as growing up more as by the time you get to high school you start to pick up on more things going on in society and, and I discovered and realized and learned that you know there was like tension between like the white kids and the black kids at my school and like starting to think like okay well why is that like what is going on here um, and then you know through the school curriculum you know I, I remember learning about that there that there is racism in America and that there is there was like huge obviously problems like slavery and then the Civil War and then Reconstruction and then the Jim Crow laws and all these horrible things that happened to and I always, I always viewed it as like it was it was all the black people in the South 
Like the people in the north were okay because they were in the north. And then it, it was the, the people who were living in the south that were the ones that were experiencing all of the racism and all of the struggle and all the problems. And then, you know, with the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King we learned about all that. And we saw how what he did in the civil rights movement kind of really changed things in the Supreme Court cases of like taking away the segregation of the schools. And so I was kind of under the impression that a lot of the, I guess, systemic racism that existed in the South was all done away with and that uh, that had all changed and that, and that generally things were better for people of color, African Americans. And then, you know, you keep growing, you keep growing. And I think like for me, um, I didn't really, it didn't really become personal. I definitely saw it in society. I definitely saw it in, in the kind of the spheres and activities and my vocation that I would do. Um, I would often with what I do be involved with a lot of African American people. And, but it never really became personal until we, until we started coming to a church that was mainly African American and started really having a lot closer and deeper relationships mm -hmm. through our small group and then really learning their experiences and really learning um, what they went through and how they experience kind of racism, as well as also just starting to understand like, well, gosh, I guess there are all these kind of systemic things that, that are bad and, and, and are keeping this kind of almost like two-tiered system up in America. Like there's the white people and then there's the black people and that there's this kind of two-tiered system of, of, of how things work. And so that's where I am now, like really discovering that that, that exists. I think we were like talking about like when that was, and I mean, I, I don't know if we can like pinpoint an exact date of like when we started talking about this, but I think we, we could safely say that that sense coming to you know the, a church that was mainly African American. That's when we really started talking about it. That was really when it was mainly became part of our normal conversations, our natural mm -hmm. conversations, things that were important to us then that we would want to talk about mm -hmm. and think about. You know, I think that we probably discussed issues of, of, of that throughout our lives and throughout our marriage. But I don't think it I don't became, have any recollections. I don't have any like real strong recollections of it. But like it became a lot more front and center with a kind of a change in church and yeah. like friend group kind of thing. The way I remember things, I don't usually remember details. Like I know certain people like remember details and words said in conversations. Mm -hmm. I more remember like feelings and thoughts. So I, I, I remember us talking and having a lot of just similar thoughts. Jeff had more understanding about the issues than I did. I think it was, um, I remember feeling really sad that people I loved had experienced this their whole lives in different ways. We had a lot of growth opportunities between where we were then and where we are now. We have a responsibility for the here and now. So I think, you know, we've had a lot of discussions. We're reading, we're learning to understand um, what our privilege of not having had to think about this all of our lives and mourning that. Um, thankful that we, that we weren't oppressed and yet at the same time feeling like, wow, we really need to be a part of uh, healing and help and not just ignore this. Um, and continue to have people suffer. Yeah. I think probably initially, um, our kids are, three of our children are young adults now. And so, you know, kind of our parenting has spanned uh, over 20 years. And I think initially, when our kids were younger, you know, our focus about r racial issues and racism and things like that was the same, probably the same way that we were raised, that God's created everybody, we have to love and respect everybody, and that, you know, this is how, this is what's expected. And as, as parents, as people, 
you know, we kind of modeled this behavior of being kind and gentle and loving towards all people. Um, and then as the kids grow and grow, then they get into history, and I know our history curriculum of what they learned had the basic kind of roadmap facts of history of what's happened in America in regard to racial issues. But it was white skewed. Yeah, it was just, yeah. and it wasn't like as, as focused as drilling in as deep as what it is. Because again, our personal, it's just, it was just all based on our personal upbringing, our personal experience, and kind of right. what we knew. Yeah. And then so as time moves on and we become more educated and we become more aware of things, then, um, you know, our conversations continue to evolve with our kids. And now, you know, we're talking a lot with our kids about these issues and some of the books and movies and things that we're looking at and investing our time in and learning and discovering, mm -hmm. we're recommending to our kids to have those same mm -hmm. kind of experiences. And so I guess all that to say is, we're kind of all moving together. Mm -hmm. Now we also have um, an elementary school child and you know it I feel heartbroken when I hear uh, my black friends talking about the the hard conversations that they have with their children and me as a feeler like that just feels so soul crushing like I wish we could spare all of them from all of this um, but so we've really started in the past short period of time explaining to our son what racism is. I would say obviously at our church, this is, you know, we've been having this conversation now since longer than Jeff and I have been here. Um, and so um, we have, a, we get, we've been really blessed um, that people have been open with sharing their experiences with us, trusting us with those. And um, so I think there's, you know, there's, there's a deep, deep sorrow um, in our church community about what's been going on. Um, and lots of people are really, you know, lamenting, and um, there's just a whole lot of emotions. Our other community that we've been really talking about this with is like our um, homeschool community, our, our kind of friends network, and um, obviously we haven't seen people face-to-face -face, um, since George Floyd because of coronavirus. But there's been a lot of conversations with those people on Facebook and through texting. And I've been really, really encouraged to see that there have been people that have been, you know, learning and growing and reading and being a part of, you know, Be The Bridge Facebook groups and stuff for a long time and really wanting to be a part of the, uh, be a part of coming alongside um, and making changes. I'm also really excited to see that there's like, you know, really practical, tangible things that we can do. I mean, even just like petitions or Subversive Institute and, um, you know, ideas on how to, um, how to make changes by petitions or, or going to our, you know, our um, government officials. So, I feel like there's um, pe more people are talking about this in our white communities, and when I say that, there still are, you know, black people in, with inside that community, but it's a it's um, majority white people. People um, are really responding and caring, and that just it just is so encouraging um, to me. And so, um, yeah. Haven't really talked, we've talked a little bit with family and just, you know, kind of, um, you know, where, where there's some sticking points, like the the common answers that most of us white people either have said or will say, well, what about this? Well, what about this? And um, we actually got to have a really, I think a really productive conversation a couple weeks ago with some family members and we were able to take like what we've learned and help move the conversation along a little bit. So I think that was, yeah, that was um, good too. Mm -hmm. 
I would say for the most part, it's brought us closer together. I think sometimes as a married couple, we can get in ruts of, you know, just being partners of, you know, the day to day. Um, I think that in the short term, we've had so many conversations, partly because we're both home from the coronavirus. And so we've had a lot more opportunity to talk. We have a lot more space and time to talk. I think because, um, praise God, we're on the same page of, you know, this was wrong. We were not, um, you were more aware than me. But now that we know, like we need to, we need to and want to um, be in there with our black brothers and sisters. And so I think that's been like unifying for us. Yeah. And to see that we're both on the same page, like one of us isn't here and the other's like, no, no, no. So that's been really, really helpful. I, I mean, I, I feel that the conversations we have are productive mm -hmm. and that they are contributing to growth, both for us individually and as a couple and yeah. as a family. Um, I also think, I feel thankful that kind of our family and our marriage is kind of a safe place where we can really pour out what we're thinking, what we're feeling, right. because, you know, this is, this is an extremely complex issue with this history that brings along with it a ton of baggage and like a ton of different things that we've heard and seen and read and experienced over the years and it's like how do you how, how our marriage is like a safe place where we can kind of process right. this all the things that we've learned and experienced and seen and everything and, <clears throat> and it's and there's sometimes you know you have these like kind of thoughts like well gosh this thought might be really offensive to somebody or this or this thought might be something that would really make somebody angry or or I would be uncomfortable maybe talking to somebody about this particular issue right. and I think our, 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 our relationship our marriage is the safe place like okay this might sound really bad what I'm gonna say to you but this is just what I'm thinking right. and I'm glad I can tell you about it right so that way we can kind of work together to process it right before it goes any further right yeah and then maybe if there was a, a question that I would like to ask somebody else maybe I could run it by you first like this is kind of like, you know, this is the heart of the question. Help me with the words to be able to express it. Right. I would just say I've been really thought thinking and trying to reflect a lot about what's been happening in, in our country and in our, in our community. And just seeing more and more of the fact that um, we really need to cling to God's truth to get us through this situation. Because um, you see all of the noise and all of the different debates and talking and everything going on. And, and some of it is just like, you're thinking like, where is this coming from? And other, other of it is, is good. And it's just like, it doesn't seem like anybody's really willing to sit down and talk about these things. That it's either just you're this or you're that. And we don't talk to each other. And in fact, we're angry at each other. We're really mad because you're this and you're that. Mm. You know, and it's just like there's no like kind of there's no glue between the groups, and I think God's word and God's truth is the glue mm. that can bring this together. We see in Revelation, you know, God says that every tribe, every tongue, every nation under heaven will be in heaven worshiping God, and so that says that God loves all people, and that God created all people. We're all image bearers of God. And I think what racism is, in my words, is that when you look at somebody that's l <clears throat> and you look at them as less than God's creation, God's you know, gift to the world, then that's where that sin of racism starts. Mm -hmm. Viewing somebody as less than mm -hmm. yourself, less than people in your group, people in your community, whatever. It's just <clears throat> this whole idea of less than. Mm -hmm. And that looking back at history, different groups of people are able to oppress other groups of people when they dehumanize them, mm -hmm. right? You see it the Nazis with how they dehumanized the Jewish people. And that's how they were able to get away with this, mm -hmm. at least in the short term. <clears throat> but then, you know, we see that in America, that the white people way back 
dehumanize the black people and were able to treat them and, and pull off treating them as slaves. Mm -hmm. And that same kind of dehumanization, that same attitude of less than is still continuing. <clears throat> and that the only thing that can really break that is the gospel and God's love that has the power to change a heart, to change a life, and that we just all, it's my prayer that for a revival and for people to be able to repent and turn mm -hmm. and bring healing. And it's, it's sad that we live in this state of like this, like I said before, a two-tiered system. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that two-tieredness needs to somehow be taken apart mm -hmm. and figured out a way. And I'm also praying that God can bring up and give us strong, good leaders. We're desperately lacking yes. leadership in our country, as a country, in our communities, on more of a state and local level, and that we desperately need gifted leaders to try to lead us out of this. Yeah. So that's, that's another one of my prayers. Mm -hmm.